Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to the online training entitled Intermediate Asset Management, Asset Inventory and Mapping. This training is being held for small water systems in Pennsylvania, Maryland, South Carolina and Wisconsin. During the training today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, please type your question into the question dialog box in your control panel. I also would like to draw your attention to the handout section located below the questions box. <laughs> um, during the presentation today, there are reference documents available for you to download and also the PowerPoint presentation is available for download. If you have any issues accessing those documents, please let me know in the questions dialog box. This webinar has been approved for or is pending approval for continuing education credit in Wisconsin, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. In order to meet the various requirements, we ask that participants interested in education credit participate in the following ways. You must attend the entire training session. You must be registered and attend using your real name and unique email address. Group viewing credit will, is not acceptable. You must participate in all poll questions, which will be given every 15 minutes. If you have any interest in receiving credit, please submit an answer to the best of your ability, even if you do not know the answer. The poll questions will help to prep you for the post-webinar quiz. You must complete this post-webinar quiz in order to receive credit. The quiz will be sent to you in the follow-up email that's sent shortly after this training. If you have any difficulties or miss a poll question, please reach out immediately in the question dialog box. During registration, you must have specified your operator ID number and state in order to receive credit. If you did not do this when registering, please input your ID and state in the questions dialog box at this time. If you have any questions or need assistance, please contact smallsystems at syr.edu. And for just a quick little bit about us, the Environmental Finance Center Network uh, provides training and technical assistance to small public water, water systems in all U.S. states and territories to help local water systems achieve their goals and stay in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so on that note, we're going to jump right in. At this time, I would like to introduce our trainers for today's session. With us today, we have our team from the University of New Mexico Environmental Finance Center. Please help me welcome James Markham, research scientist, and Haley Hijack. I'm sorry, James is a research engineer and Haley is a research scientist with the UNM Environmental Finance Center. So I welcome them aboard and James, I pass it over to you. All righty, give me a second here to show the right screen here and we'll get moving. All right. So hi everybody, thank you for being here today. I wanna to take a couple of minutes to let you know a little bit about us as an organization and then I'll jump right into the training. So uh, we are all part of the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary team with engineering, water resource, teaching, computer programming, GIS accounting and other backgrounds. And we're part of the University of New Mexico, which is located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In the center of the slide here, you can see our mission statement, uh, which is that the Southwest DFC promotes self-reliance through innovative test training and assistance focused on actionable results. And that's really kind of the core of our ethos, developing capacity and self-reliance in utilities. It's the teach a person to fish approach rather than fishing for them. You're gonna be hearing primarily from me today. Um, I've been with the EFC for about five or six years. My background is in engineering, operations, management, and law. Uh, when I'm not traveling around or more recently sitting behind my computer like I am today, uh, doing training and technical assistance, I'm usually in my basement building guitars, which I will note I build better than I play. Um, we were planning on having a second co-presenter today, uh, Luke, who is our GIS expert. He is a bit under the weather, so I'm gonna be doing both the inventory and mapping sections today, uh, but I'm familiar with both topics, so we should uh, be fine going forward. Um, Haley, Francine, you all wanna introduce yourselves? 
Sure, happy to. Hi everyone, I'm Haley Hedrick and I've been with the Southwest Environmental Finance Center for about two and a half years now and I specialize in asset management and regionalization training. So the next webinar, Criticality, will be me and uh, another one of our members, Dawn. So if you are joining us for the whole series, you'll hear my voice again next week. And hi everyone, my name is Francine Stanziano and I'm Program Manager with the Southwest Environmental Finance Center at the University of New Mexico. Um, and today I'll just be behind the scenes doing some logistical support for all the participants. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, just a reminder, um, there is a chat feature in GoToWebinar. Um, feel free to chat in questions as we go. We're going to try and sort of pull them all together and answer them at the end. But if there's something that's really unclear, uh, our other two uh, staff members here will be monitoring the chat and they will interrupt uh, so that I can clarify. So uh, with that little intro, let's get into the day's training. So today we're gonna to be talking about uh, inventory and mapping in the asset management context. And although I'm gonna discuss them independently, I think you will see that they are very related and that they build off and support one another. And just so that we can place these activities sort of within the asset management context as a whole, I'm gonna go through a very, very short overview of asset management. For those of you who attended the first session in these series, these next few slides should uh, look a little familiar. Um, and should provide a, a bit of review. So what is asset management? Well, the technical definition is providing the desired level of service at the lowest life cycle cost. And by desired level of service, we mean what you want your assets to provide uh, to your customers and the lowest life cycle cost is the best appropriate cost for your system in your particular situation. Expand it a bit further, um, asset management really helps you answer five important questions, and each of those questions kind of corresponds to the five major core components of asset management. So the first question is, what level of service do you want to provide? And if you attended our last session, you got a, a very good explanation of that core concept. Uh, the second one, which is what we're going to be talking about today, is you know what assets do you have? Uh, the third, which Haley is going to be talking about in our next series, is which uh, assets are most critical to provide the service that you want to provide for your customers. The fourth question is, how do you ensure that those assets do their job over their lifespan? And the fifth question is whether you have the money to get all of those other four things done. In asset management speak, uh, we refer to these as level of service for the first component current state of the assets or inventory, sometimes shorthand is used for the second. Uh, the third is criticality or risk management. The fourth is life cycle costing and the fifth is long-term funding. So in this series, we'll be talking about all of those, but today we're gonna to be focusing on that second core component, uh, current state of the assets. And even though I sort of laid them out in a linear fashion, I want to be clear that asset management isn't a linear process. Uh, it's an ongoing process uh, that you go through, uh, it's not something you sort of go through once and stop on. It's an approach for running the utility. Uh, it doesn't really have a beginning, doesn't really have an end. The idea is that your utility starts wherever it is and moves forward. Uh, you can't really be held responsible for things that are in the past, you can't change that, but you do use past experiences as learning opportunities. So, you know, if you already have an inventory, you might start with uh, developing uh, a risk analysis. Uh, if you don't have an inventory, that might be where you start. Uh, we typically uh, start with level of service first because you know, that kind of sets the stage for, for the others. We like to say that it's a journey, not a destination. The goal is, like I said, to move forward from wherever you are and continue that practice into the future. So hopefully the, the lessons that you learn in this series will be things that you can take back to your utility and implement and a use on an ongoing basis. And I do want to point out that while there are computer programs that are going to help you with asset management, uh, some of which we will talk about today, uh, it's important to understand that they don't do the entire job for you. They help you with analysis, they help collect data, but uh, the core part of asset management is decision making and uh, you, know, you as the operators and managers and staff members at the utility are still going to be the ones that have to make those decisions. 
So with that, a uh, very brief overview, let's jump into our first quick poll, uh, which is about um, core components. Savannah, take it away. Thank you, James. So just a reminder, please submit um, the best answer uh, to receive some credit. And the following question is, which of the following is not a core component of asset management? You can choose from level of service, program planning, life cycle costing, criticality, or long-term funding. And we'll leave this poll open for a few more moments to let folks submit their answers. And all right, we're gonna moment, we're gonna get ready to close this poll in three, two, one. And so, James, I'm not sure. Are you able to see those answers? I am actually able to see. Uh, program planning is the the one that is not like the other ones. Uh, you know, although program planning is definitely something that you will be doing uh, as part of your operations it is not one of the core components the core components are level of service life cycle costing long-term funding criticality and current state of the assets so let's talk about the current state of the assets uh the last session we uh you know went heavily into the service aspects of uh level of service aspects of asset management the second core component uh is called current state of the assets in asset management speak that's really another way of saying sort of the asset inventory and this is where we examine system assets and the information that you collect and maintain about them uh, in order to support operational analysis and data-driven decision making you're going to hear me say that several times um, that's kind of a, a core piece of what we're talking about even though we discuss current state of the assets second in our review of asset management core components as you'll see in this section it's really kind of the foundation uh, upon which everything else in asset management is built uh, it answers uh, at a very basic level some question important questions you know what assets do i have where is it all uh and the big piece is you know what do you know about your assets and it's this last bit it's the details uh, that's really the most important uh, pieces of your inventory a robust inventory is really much more than a list of the things the system owns um, and uh, again you all have seen this this quote before but uh, when you get through this you know, I want you to sort of take away from this that the asset inventory has to contain enough information to support operational analysis and data informed decision making. And by the end of this section, uh, you really should understand the basic data points that you'll need to collect about your assets in order to accomplish this goal. And we'll also give you some information on tools that you can use to collect that data. Uh, and then for the second half, we'll actually take show you uh, in a quick way how you can transform some of that information into really useful maps. So first important question, uh, what is an asset? You know, we really have to think about this uh, before we, we go in any further. And I think this image here gives you uh, an idea of what we're talking about. We've got wellheads, treatment equipment, distribution pipe, uh, valves. When I'm talking about assets, I'm talking about anything that you own or manage uh, that has value. Uh, you know, and the, the images that are shown here are sort of typical assets that a community water system is gonna have, uh, you know, treatment facilities, pipe, things like that. Second important question that you wanna be able to answer is where is they are, or where are they all located? Uh, and that's of course critical because once you know what you have, you really have to be able to find those assets in order to perform maintenance and assess them periodically. Uh, and eventually rehab and replace them. Uh, and you know, many of uh, water distribution system assets are out in the field, uh, they aren't touched on a regular basis. Uh, so keeping good track of where things are located is, is critical. Um, GPS is the gold standard for the way of doing that. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can track location, you can use addresses or map grid coordination coordinates, uh, but you know, GPS coordinates are really the best. Um, 
And a lot of times people think, well, that's a little bit of overkill. You know, the meters are typically right in front of a house, uh, so they're easy to find. Uh, but it's important to recognize that, you know, in rural areas, for example, that might not work because, it, you know, assets might not be laid out as uniformly as they are in an urban setting. And it's also important to realize that when there is an emergency, like a wildfire or you know, something like that, uh, all of the uh, things you use to locate things uh, might not be available. Uh, you know, and you've got to be able to find that critical valve to shut something off. Uh, and a GPS coordinate is going to get you to the location uh, a lot faster than an address perhaps will. Um, this picture right here, I think, gives you a good example of why the GPS coordinates are a good way to go. These are two pictures of a hydrant uh, taken from slightly different angles in the spring in New Mexico. Uh, and if you look at the left-hand side of the picture, you can see the hydrant, but it's barely there. And in another couple of months, you wouldn't be able to see it at all. Um, as again, uh, you know, finding things can be particularly troublesome in rural locations, uh, and you really want to be able to find critical assets, uh, even if the landmarks that you're used to looking at things for are not there. So use GPS coordinates where you can. In the second half, we'll be demonstrating uh, a relatively inexpensive and simple way to get GPS coordinates uh, with uh, readily available technology. Uh, and while we're on the subject of location, uh, it's kind of important to note that you can actually split your assets into two basic groups uh, based on how you track their location. The first set of assets is your field assets. This is typically wells, pipes, valves, meters, uh, the things that are out in the field, and they're gonna have their own individual uh, GPS coordinates. So every valve in your system should have its own GPS coordinate. Every meter in your system should have its own GPS coordinate. The other kind of assets that you're typically gonna have are what we call plant assets or vertical assets. And those are typically gonna be things like your treatment equipment. Uh, and those kinds of assets will typically use the plant coordinates for all of them. The idea being that if you found the front door of the plant, you found everything in it. Um, so when we think about booster stations, which are typically out in the field, um, these would typically be treated uh, as plant assets where, uh, you know, for example, if we're out doing a mapping uh, project, we typically hang in a GPS uh, on the door knob and then go inside and inventory all of the assets that are in there. Um, you could do individual coordinates, but in a situation like this, it's really not all that necessary. The third question uh, that you need to answer is what do you need to know about your assets? Um, and this is where the asset inventory or current state of the assets really starts to become useful because, you know, this is where all the important detail is. So think about what kind of uh, details you might want to collect. Um, we can use this hydrant um, as an example. One way to determine what data you want to collect is to think about the questions you want to answer about an asset. Um, if we look at this hydrant, for example, things we might want to know is, you know, its asset name, where it is, maybe what condition it's in, how long it's gonna last out in the field so I can do some, some capital improvement planning, uh, maybe replacement cost uh, if it's getting near the end of its life, knowing whether it's operational or not, uh, what the pressure is there, maybe if it'll support fire flow or as part of a flushing program or a testing uh, program, and maybe even what the color means because the color codes are, are mean, meaningful as well. Um, and if you look at this list of things I put here, you'll sort of recognize that some of these are very general uh, kind of attributes, uh, like ID and location and cost that would probably apply to all of your assets. And some of them are very specific to hydrants, like the flushing program and the color. Um, so um, what I want you to take away from this uh, is that, you know, first off, these are not the only questions you could be asking. And second off is that, there are gonna be general pieces of data that you're gonna collect for all of your assets, and then different classes of assets are gonna have class-specific data that you collect about them. So for your motors, for example, you're gonna be probably collecting horsepower information, things like that. Um, so let's talk about uh, these uh, first uh, categories here, sort of the general categories of information that you wanna collect on all of your assets. Every asset in your system should have a unique name and or ID associated with it. 
Um, you want them to be unique and manageable. And you want to make sure that when an asset is replaced, that the old ID number uh, is replaced as well so that you can keep your attribute data straight. Um, this is particularly important uh, with pipes and break data. Uh, we do a lot of uh, infrastructure analysis. Uh, and one thing we see quite often is uh, inventory information that shows a pipe's been in the ground for five years, but there is break data that's associated with that pipe going back two or three decades. Uh, and the reason that happens is that when the old pipe was replaced, the event information associated with that pipe wasn't archived. Uh, so that ends up being often sort of the first type of cleanup we want to do uh, when we're doing uh, that kind of analysis. So uh, it's critical critical to uh, make sure that the information you're collecting about a specific asset is tied to that specific asset. Uh, and when an asset is replaced, uh, the new asset gets a new ID number and the old asset ID number gets retired and archived. Obviously, we don't want to throw that information away. Uh, it's very useful, particularly for forward planning. Uh, you know, you want to archive that in some way so that it's associated with the old asset, but you want to make sure that old events aren't associated with new, uh, new infrastructure. Um, those asset IDs should ideally be meaningful. Um, they don't have to be super complicated, uh, and they have to be meaningful to your system. Here's a very simple set of ID structures that you could use to help differentiate your assets. Uh, you might start all of your meters with the initial M and valves uh, with abbreviations that identify which kind of valve they are. Um, you know, this is useful because it helps you sort and filter based on specific types of assets. Uh, so whether you're you know, working in an Excel program or in a very complicated GIS, uh, if you use smart naming conventions like this, it really makes it easy to sort of segregate different kinds of assets and look at one thing at a time and do comparisons. Um, again, this isn't the only way to do it. Uh, I've seen systems that literally just use uh, a numerical system where the first asset is one and the second asset is two, and it just works forward from there. But I think uh, using a more meaningful system is better because when you do that, when you're looking at an asset ID, you have some idea of what it is you're talking about uh, without even having to look, look up information on it. Recognize that a lot of times there's going to be assets that are related but distinct that you might want to track uh, separately. And by that, I mean, you know, and an asset that has multiple components, such as you know a booster pump. Uh, it might have a pump and a motor and an associated valve, and each one of those might have uh, different maintenance schedules. Uh, they might be different ages, so you may want to track them separately. Uh, and so uh, in an inventory context, we call these parent-child relationships, where the booster is the parent uh, and the components are the children. So you can kind of track it in two different ways. One is sort of how's the booster doing in general, but then also track and do maintenance on the individual components there. This can go you know, multiple layers deep, of course. Uh, if we're looking at a booster station, the parent um, might actually be the entire station structure and the children would be the building itself and the pumps inside, and then maybe the grandchildren uh, or the children of the pump might be the motor and the valve. Uh, the idea here is not to show you the definitive way of doing this, just to get you to understand that there are going to be relationships uh, and differentiations that you want to maintain in your inventory so that you can track these individual components uh, appropriately. Uh, second thing or next thing that you really want to keep track of in your inventory is condition. And by condition, I mean uh, tracking the physical state of an asset at a given moment in time. Um, this is going to help you inform useful remaining life, uh, maintenance, interventions, replacement, and other kinds of asset decisions. Um, so here we've got four different hydrants that are in various states of disrepair. And what we want to be able to do is uniformly assess their conditions so that we can keep track of that condition over time. Um, so the question obviously is, well, how do I evaluate condition? Uh, the simple answer is to develop a condition rating system uh, for your assets. Um, and although it seems kind of complicated, uh, it's really not. Um, you can basically start with a five-step condition scale. Um, 
It could be uh, ranked one to five. Uh, you could use an excellent, poor, average, you know, fair. Uh, I got those in the wrong order. <laughs> um, uh, scale, uh, A, B, C, D, E kind of thing. Theoretically, I guess you could even use emojis uh, if you wanted to, although that would probably only work in a paper context because I think it would be hard to sort an Excel spreadsheet based on uh, emojis or a database. Uh, so maybe not that, but the other ones are, are perfectly fine. Uh, but coming up with a scale is really only half of the process. No matter what approach you take, you have to define sort of objectively what each of those ratings mean. So, you know, what is a two? How do you define that? What is a three? What is a four? What is a five? Um, you want to use as objective a criteria as you can. And basically, that's just to ensure that similar assets are graded similarly. You know, the... Uh, you don't want two different people coming up with different ratings. Uh, and if you don't provide criteria, that is exactly what will happen. If your staff's left to their own devices, um, everybody's gonna sort of come up with their own definitions, which may be similar or not. And then second, there's a tendency to gravitate toward the middle with grading. Nobody really wants to be wrong. So you, if you don't provide uh, discrete information uh, about those uh, rating categories, most of your assets will probably end up getting graded more or less average, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of doing condition rating because you want to be able to differentiate your assets so that you know which ones are doing poorly and need to be assessed, addressed now, which ones are doing very well and maybe only need to, to have routine maintenance done. Um, we really want everybody to agree what fair and excellent means so that they can apply those uh, correctly uh, and also apply them correctly over time because condition is something you know, is going to happen. Condition rating is something that's going to happen a lot uh, over the course of an asset's life. You know, a hydrant might last 50, 60 years. So we find that the easiest way to do this is start on the opposite end of the scale and work toward the middle. Middle. So, for example, uh, for hydrants, uh, we might decide that you know. A, rating of excellent or one is a hydrant that has no visible leaks where all the caps are in place. There's no known internal problems, no visible rust or damage, only requires routine maintenance and is fully operational. So that's the high end of our scale. Then we would go down to the low end and say, well, how do we want to uh, categorize this? Well, maybe that's going to be you know, visible leaks, missing caps, known internal problems, significant rust or damage, maybe it requires frequent maintenance or is already non-operational. Once we've got the two ends of the scale figured out, we can basically work our way through the middle and then define what those in-between conditions are. So we can figure out, you know, what's a two, a three, a four, or what's a good, an average, a fair. So what you should end up with is something like this. And I don't expect you to read and absorb all this all the time. And this is actually in the handouts uh, that Savannah is going to push out uh, to you through the chat feature today. Um, but the idea here is to take this home. You can use it as a reference. It's not the definitive uh, hydrant scale uh, to be used, um, but it basically lays out how you would uh, develop and apply objective criteria that can be used in the field uh, so that, you know, when different people are grading the assets, they're getting them more or less the same uh, giving them more or less the same grade uh, if they have the same kinds of conditions and also so that over time uh, your condition ratings are applied systematically. So with that, we will jump into our next quick poll question, which is about methods for communicating asset condition. Thanks, James. So again, for any folks interested in receiving credit, please select the answer to the best of your ability. And the question is true or false when selecting a method for communicating asset condition. It doesn't matter what I choose as long as it makes sense to me. And we'll leave this poll open for a few more moments to let folks answer their questions. And I see them trickling in just a few more moments here. And we will get ready to close this poll in three, two, one. It is false. <laughs> you know, it should make sense to you, but it's got to make sense to everybody else as well. So it is really uh, important to make sure that everybody uh, who's going to be working with the condition ratings and data has easily understood 
uh, criteria to work with and just because it makes sense to you does not necessarily mean it's going to make sense to somebody else um, and on that subject it is often a very good idea to do uh, the development of those objective criteria in a group setting uh, so that you can sort of develop a consensus internally uh, among the folks that actually deal with those specific assets uh, about the criteria and uh, using pictures is actually a good way to go about it as well you know so that if someone in the field is doing some condition rating uh, not only do they have uh, cri written criteria that they can look at but they could have uh, pictures that might give them an idea of where uh, something belongs on a scale. And while I'm on that subject, there are actually two ways that you can do your tissue condition ratings. And I refer to them as field grading versus field assessment. And by field grading, I mean having the folks that are out doing the condition assessments actually review the criteria and assign that, you know, one to five grade or excellent to poor. Um, the other option is to uh, have either a, a worksheet or uh, a tablet application that lets you check off the criteria but does not actually assign the grade in the field uh, or takes the onus off the operator and assigns the grade based on the boxes they've checked off. Uh, doing it the latter way requires a little bit more setup, uh, but it does kind of take the onus off of the field member, field staff member, uh, for having uh, to assign the final grade. And sometimes that is uh, easier for people uh, to do um, and accept. Uh, so it really kind of depends on you know how your staff feels about this. Either way is perfectly acceptable. Um, doing it. Uh, the latter way, the field assessment, I think often produces a little more consistent results because uh, you know, we're all proud of our systems and sometimes it feels like uh, if we you know, mark down the assets, we're, we're sort of digging our, our, our own ourselves and we don't wanna do that. So when you're thinking about how you want the condition assessment uh, done, you know, think about your two options uh, and, and how they're gonna work uh, with your particular staff. Again, you want to end up uh, with things distributed appropriately, not all gravitating toward the middle. The next critical component uh, that you really want to track in your inventory is remaining useful life. And this is usually going to be done uh, via some sort of a formula where uh, assets uh, have a typical lifespan. Uh, you know when they were installed uh, by doing some very basic math, you can figure out generally uh, where uh, they might actually need to be replaced. But obviously, uh, those uh, standards out there really have to be informed by your own experience. You know, every asset is going to go through uh, a service life on a curve that looks something like this yellow curve. The idea being that when you first install it, assuming it was installed correctly, it's in its best possible condition. And over time, it's going to deter deteriorate. And eventually, uh, it's not going to meet the minimally acceptable service level that you established in stage one. Um, and at that point, it'll have to be rehabbed, replaced, uh, or repaired. Um, it may not actually be functionally broken at that point, but it's basically not doing what you need it to do. Um, by tracking condition uh, and knowing when something was installed, uh, the idea is that over time, instead of waiting for something to fail, you'll be able to intervene somewhere in between those two red lines where condition is getting worse uh, rapidly, uh, but the asset hasn't yet completely failed. Uh, and the reason you wanna do that obviously is because then you're doing uh, repair, rehab and replacement at the time of your choosing. You know, planned intervention's always gonna be cheaper than reactive intervention. Um, I do wanna make it very clear, and you probably noticed we don't have any uh, information on specific timelines that you should use for specific kinds of assets. That information is out there and available, uh, but it's really important to recognize that the typical useful life of an asset might be X number of years under ideal conditions, but your mileage can vary. Um, you know, the particular conditions uh, that your assets are in, whether that's acidic soil or, you know, maybe uh, being out on a coast, um, can really impact dramatically the lifespan of your assets. So, you know, getting, you know, manufacturer information and, and other information that's, for example, available from the AWWA on how long assets typically last is a great starting point, but you really need to uh, update 
that and collect uh, condition information over time so that you can calibrate your expectations and have a realistic uh, understanding of how assets are uh, deteriorating in your particular setting. So this is kind of a part science, part art kind of thing that you really want to uh, bring your own experience and knowledge to. Next critical piece is replacement cost. You know, we've been talking about figuring out when things are going to have to be replaced. Uh, if you keep track of replacement costs over time and include that in your inventory, uh, it will be relatively easy to have a general idea of how much money you're going to be on the hook for in the short term, the medium term, and the long term. Uh, it's important to note that this is not what you paid for the asset, but what it's going to cost to replace it with whatever the current model is. So if you're talking about replacing 20-year-old manual meters with an AMI infrastructure, it's the cost of that new AMI infrastructure. Um, now, this doesn't have to be an exact cost. This isn't something that you're going to use uh, to figure out you know, the exact amount you're going to need uh, for bidding purposes uh, on the project. Uh, it's more of a general cost, and obviously, over time, it's going to, uh, uh, the further out you, you're talking about, the, the less accurate it's going to be. But you do want to sort of periodically review these costs just to make sure uh, there's enough money in the bank or there's enough funding available from available sources to do what you need to do. Next important uh, category is size. Um, recognize here that size means different things in different contexts. So for a meter, you know, size is going to be diameter, but if you're talking about a tank, it's going to be volume or maybe area if it's on the ground. Um, you know, like I said before, motors might be horsepower. A size is really important. Uh, because it's going to help you uh, with that whole costing piece uh, and keep track of, of what you have. Particularly for pipe, you really want to keep track of, of materials. Uh, virtually every system I've ever seen is made up of a lot of different kinds of materials, even if it starts out uh, being created with one material. Um, those assets, those pipe assets and those materials uh, deteriorate at different rates and typically you know, systems uh, grow over time. Uh, keeping track of materials is really going to help you sort of extrapolate um, information from one section to another. Obviously, pipes underground, uh, so it's hard to see. So keep track of, of materials uh, to make that analysis easier. Um, and age is another important thing that you really want to capture, but recognize that it's not the best predictor of lifespan. Uh, you know, it's Good to know when an asset was installed so that when you're evaluating your assets, you can extrapolate condition from other similarly aged and placed assets. Uh, but as I said before, you know, with most assets, your mileage may vary depending on uh, the conditions. So uh, recognize that age is a factor, but not the only factor. We recently did a pipe break analysis on a system that had pipe dating back to the 1930s. And the actual worst pipe in their system was installed in the 1950s, followed by pipe that was installed in the 70s and then the 1930s. So consider age as a factor, track that. It's really useful, but it's not the end all be all. There are a lot of other pieces of information you might want to keep in your uh, asset inventory, you know, operational status, manufacturer information, warranty, supplier contact, order lead time. Uh, this is an area where it's entirely system dependent. You keep information that is useful to you. You know, you don't want to be doing useful, useless data collection exercises. So if you're not going to use a piece of data for analysis, uh, I would say don't collect it. But again, think about what might be important uh, and try to fill in that information. You know, those are all useful pieces of data that can go in an inventory. Um, and this is sort of just touching the surface, but these are kind of the, the minimum things that you really want to have in there. Uh, when you are developing your inventory, you know, start from your existing sources. You know, as with most asset management uh, uh, components, we often find that people have more information than they think once they start looking. You know, most systems have got some sorts of as-builts. Uh, a lot of times the assets themselves will actually have information about them on them. You know, this is a label from a tank, uh, gives you the size and the model, and sometimes even the install date is in there. Um, when you're collecting information, consider who's gonna use the data and how they're gonna use it um, so that you collect all of the information that you, you need um, and if, for example, you're a joint uh, drinking water system and wastewater system, think about uh, you know, where those systems overlap, 
uh, maybe where staff overlap and whether you need to differentiate those assets uh, in your inventory so that you can tell which things belong to the wastewater system and which things belong to the drinking water system. In all likelihood, there are going to be a lot of different kinds of records and notes and maybe even video and pictures that you have, all of which can be used. Um, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words and a video might be worth even more. Um, you know, the important thing is that you collect what you have and, and try to use it systematically. Uh, if you're not sure where to start, uh, another document that Savannah's going to push out for you through the, uh, the chat feature is this reference guide for asset management that we've put together. Uh, it doesn't cover every uh, class of asset, but it has the main ones. And what we've put in here is essentially the necessary data that should be collected about uh, each class of asset and some optional information that you might want to collect, uh, which could be useful to you. Uh, and then we've also gone through and kind of uh, brainstorm different inventory locations that you might uh, look to find some of this information. So that should be pushed out to you. It's also available on our website. So we've talked a little bit about what at a bare minimum should be in your asset inventory. Now let's talk about where you want to store it. Um, you know, there's a lot of different possibilities. Um, there's, you know, very uh, complex CMMS systems like Maximo uh, that are also very expensive. There's simpler versions, there's GIS, there is Excel. You could do it on paper if you're very, very small, uh, although paper makes the analysis uh, very hard. Uh, if uh, you are starting out, maybe you've got a paper inventory and you're trying to get into the digital world, Excel is an easy way to, to, to go. Um, on our website, the, the uh, URL is there. Uh, we've got a spreadsheet uh, that we've built that does a lot of the calculations like remaining useful life and things like that uh, for you. It's got room for about 10,000 different assets. You can download this free and customize it. Um, it's not password protected. Uh, and you know, through the, the technical assistance program that's available uh, through this uh, EPA grant that we're presenting to you under, uh, we can help you with that as well. A couple of things about the inventory. Try to be as complete as possible. You know, you don't want to necessarily include everything. You don't want to, you know, inventory the pencils in your system, uh, but you do want to uh, prioritize, you know, the important data on the important assets. Um, keep it current. Uh, you know, that's sort of a, a mantra with asset management uh, and sort of points back to that cyclical nature of things. You want things to remain current so that uh, it remains useful over time and fix errors as you get, as you find them. You know, if you, go dig a hole to do a repair and you find out that the eight inch pipe on your map is actually a six inch pipe, update that information so that your accurate inventory is more accurate and complete. And super critical, keep data keys. Uh, if you're using Excel spreadsheets or a database, quite often you are going to end up using abbreviations or codes for different things. Do not lose them. You know, we worked recently with a utility that had 30 plus years of, of break data and uh, a few, a little over 30 break uh, codes to describe different kinds of break on different kinds of material and they lost the key. So uh, because they didn't have the definitions for the codes, we knew where the breaks had happened, but not uh, what kind of breaks they were. So it made the analysis very difficult. So make sure that your data keys don't get lost. So quick inventory review, uh, back to <laughs> our opening slide, you know, the inventory really should contain enough information to support operational analysis and data informed decision making. At a minimum, you want to track asset names and IDs, location, condition, remaining useful life, and replacement cost. Uh, and ideally, you would supplement that with other useful information like size, volume, age, material, and anything else that is really useful to you in your system uh, for the analysis that you need. So one more quick poll. Uh, Savannah, you can throw that up there. Thanks, James. And so again, for attendees, please submit an answer to the best of your ability if you're interested in receiving credit. The question that we're asking now, please select an answer to what activities can a robust inventory support? And we're gonna keep this poll open for a few more moments here to let folks get their answers in. And I'm still here. We're just going to keep this poll open for a few more moments. I see answers trickling in.
and we'll get ready to close this poll in three, two, one. All of the above, <laughs> that is correct. So uh, most of y'all got that right. Yeah, you want your, your inventory to be able to support your operational function, your business analysis and your management activities. Um, that's kind of the, the key takeaway from this. So I do wanna reiterate that, you know, developing an inventory is really about process. Um, you'll see, I like these, these graphics, you know, uh, when you're sitting down to develop your inventory, plan what you're going to collect, what tools you're going to need, and we'll talk about tools here in just a second, and what sort of time frame you're working in. Go out and collect that data. Uh, recognize that it's going to be in a lot of different places. Some of your information is going to be collected in the field. Some of it may be in the office. Some of it may be on maps. Um, combine those sources. Pull them together uh, to, to try and come up with, you know, a consistent picture and proof it you know recognize that uh particularly if you're using data from multiple sources there are going to be conflicts that you're going to need to work out uh and then most importantly use it for analysis you know developing the inventory it's a tool it's there to be used um you don't want to sort of develop an inventory and then sit it on the shelf and not not do anything with it uh, it's a living document uh, should be reviewed on about an annual basis uh and and looked over and you know this Developing in the inventory is really about knowledge management in the uh, utility context. You know, utilities are going to outlast uh, most of their employees. You know, some utilities have been around for 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years, and they're going to be around for a lot longer. Um, the whole process here is about taking information that's an in individual people in the utilities head, documenting it, you know, uh, so that that information can be shared, digitizing that. Uh, preferably in some sort of, you know, program that can be used for analysis like Excel or GIS or a database uh, so that you can visualize it. And this is, you know, what the second half of our, our training uh, today is really about, uh, pattern recognition and analysis and using data from multiple sources. Because if you do this, you end up uh, with a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, the, the utility ends up with, you know, collective data and knowledge that's available to everyone. Uh, so while we're on that topic, let's talk briefly about some data collection options uh, in the digital age. Um, a lot of folks, I think, when they, they look at the idea of collecting GPS coordinates and, and, and this kind of information, and think, oh my God, the expense. Uh, you know, and yes, you know, if you were going to try and buy a fully integrated survey grade uh, system, it might cost you upwards of twenty thousand uh, dollars to do that. I mean, if you have this kind of equipment, great, use it. But recognize that you don't actually need this uh, to get the level of accuracy and the information uh, that you you need to to build an inventory. One of the options we use uh, is essentially an iPad with a handheld Bluetooth uh, GPS receiver. Um, and I'll be showing you a demonstration video here shortly on how uh, that works. You know, the great thing about uh, tablet apps is they're easy to use, they're easy to set up, um, they really help you collect uniform data uh, in, a, in a very simple way. Recognize also Fulcrum is not the only uh, version of this kind of software out there. It's one we happen to use, uh, but there are a lot of other good ones out there. There's an option called QField. Uh, it's an open source program uh, that runs on Android and it's actually built for QGIS or QGIS, which is one of uh, the GIS programs we'll talk about in the second half of our session today. And there are many, many others. I and mean, if you go into the Apple or the Android app store, you can find many free or inexpensive uh, solutions for collecting data. When you're thinking about this, think about uh, what technology you have and what kind of functionality you need, um, you know, and, and what your sort of internal level of, of expertise and comfortableness with technology is. Um, what we've got listed here is a simple table that we pulled together. It's got four different uh, uh, surveying options on the left, you know, collector, which is an ArcGIS, uh, tool, Survey123, Fulcrum, which is one of the ones that we use, and GPS Fields Area Measure, which is another one, and different operating systems. Uh, and sort of when you're doing your review, this is kind of a good way to approach it. You know, do you just need points? Like maybe all you're really concerned about initially is uh, figuring out where the valves and the manholes and various uh, sort of point assets are. Well, then you don't necessarily need lines because you can draw the lines in between them. Um, if that's the case, 
um, you know, fulcrum might work if you decide, you know, you actually want to trace a uh, pipe on the ground. Uh, Fulcrum is not going to be the tool for you. You're going to want to use something like Collector for ArcGIS. But to show you how easy this data collection process is, I've got a very short video here that I'm going to play. It takes about seven minutes and kind of walks you through the process of building an app and, uh, and using it. So enjoy. This is a short video about field data collection. In this case, we're using an iPad running Fulcrum's software and a Bad Elf GNSS receiver. By pairing a GPS or GNSS receiver with your iOS or Android mobile device, you can take advantage of the GPS accuracy of the receiver and the data collection capabilities of your mobile device. Fulcrum has a web interface that you can use to build data collection applications and also to review and edit your data. We'll start by looking at the web interface of a simple hydrant data collection application, and then we'll use that same application to do some field data collection. So what we're looking at here is the designer portion of Fulcrum's web interface for the app that I built for hydrant data collection. What you see on the left-hand side are the basic kinds of fields that you can use, and on the right-hand side, you can see the configured app that I've already created under layout. Uh, each of these different fields uh, are essentially drag and drop. As you'll see here, I'm going to add in a date field, which simply involves me grabbing the date field from the left, dragging it to the location in the application that I want it to be in, and then configuring it with a label and a description. You'll notice there are a variety of different kinds of fields that are available, text, numeric, yes, no, dates, single and multiple choice, fields, fields that will do calculations. You can also use the design fields uh, to organize your application. You'll notice I have several sections here, one for date field data, one for general data, and so on. By clicking on the pre-configured fields that you've created, you can edit them and verify that the information you're using is correct. So for here, for example, I've got hydrant size with a couple of different uh, size options. I notice I didn't put in a description for serial number, so I'm going back and filling that in. Under type, I've got three options. I'm making this a required field because I want to make sure that data gets collected in the field. You can also preview an application that you've built via the web interface by clicking on the preview app button. That will show you the basic layout uh, that a mobile user will see in terms of the order that fields are going to be listed in and whether they will be visible or not. For example, you could create an application and hide the office data because that won't be actually used in the field. Obviously, anytime you make changes to your applications, do not forget to save. So let's use this app to go actually collect some data. So I've got my GNSS receiver here, which I've placed on top of the hydrant. And what you're seeing now is a screen capture of the data collection process from the iPad itself. So I'm picking a hydrant type. I'm picking a manufacturer off a pre-configured list. Same goes with the size. In this case, my hydrant does not have a serial number. I'm skipping that. It does have an isolation valve. It's a single color. You notice those red asterisks indicate that the fields are mandatory. Uh, pictures are very, very important. Always take those. In this case, I've actually taken a picture of the GNSS receiver as well. Before I save the record, I check my location. One of the nice things you can do with this is actually modify the place of your record using the base map. There's actually an Android interface for this I mentioned. This is essentially the same uh, data collection application, but uh, you'll see that the, the layout of the interface is slightly different because of the different operating systems. That being said, the list of information is exactly the same. Uh, it's just laid out a little bit differently. So once you sync your data, with the cloud from your mobile device, all of that information that you collected will be available on the web interface and anything that's been added to the web interface since the last time you synced will now be available on your mobile device. 
So we're going to view some of the records that we've collected. These uh, little pink dots uh, represent hydrants uh, that we've collected in and around the UNM campus area. I have a, a couple of options in terms of how to look at them. I can look at uh, just the data. I can look at a combination of the data and the map. I can also filter each of these uh, various conditions. So for example, if I just want to see my Mueller hydrants, I can click on that and it will reduce the list of those. And if I go back to my map and look at them, the only thing that will be shown are the Mueller hydrants. You'll notice I have a somewhat busy base map back here. I'm going to change that for ease of use to a simple street map, kind of like a Google map, which clears away some of the clutter and makes the points a little bit more visible. So you can see a few of them scattered around. I'm looking at records that are in this field. Uh, there are about 31 total. Uh, it's showing me the records below that it can see in the map. So if I zoom out on my map, you'll see the records below get populated to, to reference everything that's currently in the visual frame of the map. I can do a quick view of the data related to any record, uh, which will essentially give me a short form layout with all of the information. I can also click on the picture and it will bring me to a more detailed picture relating to the image itself, which not only shows me the picture, but where I took it and some metadata about the image. Now, obviously, once the information's up there, I'll probably want to download that. I've got a lot of options, CSV, Excel, Esri shape files. Uh, I can download either the filtered or the unfiltered data from here. I can also download this information from the main app page where we started out by simply going to the exporter. The advantage I have here is that I can unload multiple uh, files from a lot of different apps that I have created. All right, so that's a, a brief overview, uh, just to kind of give you the idea uh, of how you know, easy data collection can be in the field uh, if you set up and use one of these kind of applications. Um, if you have any questions about Fulcrum or other similar applications, you know, feel free to get in contact with us. Uh, this is something that Luke and I uh, both love to geek out on and we'd be glad to help you. Um, so now we're gonna shift gears from sort of what belongs in your inventory and how you might wanna collect the data to the map making side of things. Uh, and unfortunately, Luke couldn't be with us today, so I am gonna be taking over and doing his section for us. So uh, instead of being presented by Luke Andrews, it's presented by James again. So in this section, uh, what we're gonna talk about is some basic GIS information, you know, the value of mapping uh, your assets and the utility thereof, uh, available mapping resources, uh, the functions that some GIS programs can do, uh, try to figure out uh, give you some information about figuring out which GIS platform is right for you and give you some info on how to get started with mapping your assets. So to start off first, what is GIS? Um, it stands for Geographic Information System, uh, and a GIS is a system for storing, communicating, and working with geographic information. It can be really complex or very, very simple, and technically speaking, a hand-drawn map on the back of a napkin, like the one we've got on the right-hand side of our picture here, is technically a GIS because it systematically communicates some geographical information. Uh, you know, in this context today, we're gonna be looking at GIS as a way of producing water system asset maps uh, and working with and analyzing utility data. Uh, I know this is uh, an area that a lot of smaller systems are hesitant to get into uh, because of the sort of perceived uh, technological complexity of it, uh, but it's actually not as difficult as you might think. Uh, and it's really something that's worth getting into even for smaller systems. Uh, uh, and just mapping data in general is really, really important because they tell you so much more than uh, what something is and where it is. You know, they can tell you, uh, for example, you know, who made a repair, uh, when something happened, uh, why it happened. 
how it happened and maybe even how much it was it cost and the nice thing about this in a gis context is there's a database in the background that can store all of this information but the big idea is for behind mapping is that maps show you patterns um, and identifying the patterns in your data can potentially save utilities significant amount of money by allowing them to develop more efficient capital improvement and, and replacement plans. So let's look at some data. Um, you know, maps come in a variety of formats. This is an example of a paper map book for a system we worked with. Uh, each operator had a copy of this and there was a copy in the truck and you can see handwritten notes on there. And when you're working with paper maps, this is really an excellent way of updating information. The drawback is that each operator has a different set of notes and often there's not consistency across the various maps. So whether you're working with paper or digital GIS, it's a good practice to consolidate any updates or new information that you receive periodically so that all the maps are uniform and up to date. If you have paper maps and are interested in moving to digital GIS, those paper maps are incredibly useful for getting started and can actually be incorporated directly into the digital format. Um, this is the exact same information pulled into a digital GIS, uh, and you can see the handwritten notes are actually even displayed there, as well as the digitized water lines that were traced in from the asphalt drawings. And to do this, we did something called geocoding the assets, uh, which will show you how it works here in a second. And then we combined those with existing other maps and CAD files that the system had and created a utility specific geometric network for both the water and the wastewater, although we're only showing you the water right here. So we basically digitized those paper zone atlas maps uh, that were used by the operators and included all of those system notes into the database. Um, as semi-transparent layers so that the handwritten notes are both visible when you're looking at the map, but they're also in the database as well. Um, data is going to be in a lot of different formats, and if it's digital, you can probably use it. Um, this is another example of information from the same system, um, which was sewer and leak call log data uh, that was recorded by hand, you know, but you can see there's a lot of details. There's addresses, there's timestamps, there's notes about um, the, the, the specific events. And all of that information can be pulled into uh, the GIS system. And it becomes much more workable when incorporated into a digital GIS. This is an example of, of a water and wastewater system. On the left-hand side, you can see a table of contents that shows all of the different data layers that are included in the map. Each layer is stored as a separate file on the computer and it can be turned on or off in the display by ticking those little check boxes next to the names. And we call them layers because they essentially are layers that stack on top of each other to build the map. And you can see that we currently have the water uh, mains layer selected and the attribute data collected for those assets is, is displayed in the middle of the screen there in that open table. Um, that attribute table shows all of the data that's been collected for the assets in that layer. Um, you can select individual assets. That blue line is the asset that's currently been selected. Um, and you can select assets uh, from the attribute table uh, by different characteristics as well. Um, you know, we can see in this particular uh, field here, the data that's been collected for this pipe segment. We've got a facility identifier, which is basically the asset ID that I talked about earlier. We've got pipe material, diameter, water type, uh, install date, who owns and manages it, when the last time the pipe was updated, geometric length, uh, you know, all sorts of information, basically any question you want to ask and collect data on can be added here. And having a complete asset uh, list like this, particularly of pipe lengths, really makes that valuation of your system much easier down the road. You know, I was talking about useful replacement costs or tracking replacement costs uh, in, in a digital format like this. If you've got a basic cost for four inch pipe, it's really easy to figure out uh, how much four inch pipe you have in the system and how much it might cost to replace it. Um, so to do that, we can just open up the layer properties window for that water mains layer and start a query. And here we're using a query builder uh, for a real basic definitional query to select only the pipe segments that we're interested in. So you can see we've got the diameter being four inches and the material being PVC. If we run this query, it'll pull up all the information on all the four inch PVC pipe in the system. And once this has been applied, the only thing you see in the map are those segments that fit the definition. The other pipe's obviously not erased, uh, but it's hidden from view temporarily. And this is one of the things that makes uh, working with a GIS so useful. You've got a ton of information in there, but you can easily work with um, much smaller categories or quantities of materials. 
So what we've got here is a rather complex and completely built out map of a combined water and sewer utility, and it's a little busy right now, but we can choose what layers we want to see by turning them on and off in the, in the table of contents. So if I want to turn off the sewer layer, this is what I get. Uh, it's just the water mains uh, and, and appurtenances that are attached to that. So I've got the valves and shutoff valves and lateral lines uh, and each lateral connection point and the hydrants. Um, so you know, I can just as easily turn off all the meters, all the connection lines. You know, if I'm just trying to do uh, a hydrant count, it's easy to do. So when you're working in a GIS system, because it's so easy to segregate information, when you're collecting data, there's really no reason not to go for the gusto and kind of try to get everything in there uh, and build out as complete a picture as, as you possibly can. Uh, this is the other half of that map, uh, the sewer side. You can see that there's mains and connections and cleanouts and laterals and things like that there. Uh, basically, any available and useful data can be included in your maps. You could have a layer in here that showed all of the repairs that had been done or where there was root intrusion. Um, uh, or you know, on the main side where you had pinhole breaks versus cracks so that you could really sort of do those condition assessments and work forward. Um, Capturing this kind of information is really important. Um, you can also embed video and audio recordings into those digital GIS maps. And you know that's a great way to communicate information that might only exist in somebody's head. I'm not gonna play the video that's associated with this, uh, but this is up in Alaska. And the operator that's standing there explains that due to the elevation of a newly constructed tank, the tank that you're looking at, which you normally could be filled to 18 feet, can now only get filled to 16 feet because the other tank, which is a mile away and out of sight, will actually overflow if you fill this tank completely. You know, and that's the kind of information that you definitely don't want your new crew members to find out the hard way. Um, so, you know, when you're doing that data collection and if you're doing a collection with an app like the one I showed you before, uh, you can collect video and audio uh, information uh, about your assets on the fly in the field. Um, so let's jump to a quick poll here. Um, Savannah, if you can pull up the next one. Of course, thanks James. So the first question that we're asking you to answer to the best of your ability is a, you can select as many choices as you think are correct. And the question is, a GIS map can help you with which of the following? Practice, practice asset management, sell more water, prioritize maintenance by identifying problem areas, or field locate assets. And again, if you're interested in receiving credit, please select all of the answers that you believe answer this question to the best of your ability. And we'll leave this poll open for a few more moments to let folks submit their answers. And we'll get ready to close the poll in three, two, one. And so right on the money, the correct answers are highlighted here with practice asset management, prioritize maintenance by identifying problem areas, and field locate assets. All right, everybody's paying attention, that's good. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit here and, and go over some examples of kinds of analysis that you can do with a digital GIS to hopefully um, kind of uh, explain why going down this road might be really useful for you. Um, the information that you're looking at here is from a pretty good sized Midwestern city uh, that we dealt with. Uh, and this was actually you know, quite a big uh, place that had a lot of information but did not have a GIS for their water pipe yet. Uh, most of this city's distribution pipe is in the 75 to 100 year old range and uh, they knew they needed to do a lot of replacement, but they really had no way of prioritizing it. And what they had done in the past is essentially, you know, started at the west end of town, picked a street and worked their way down. Um, so what they wanted to do was see if there was a way to visualize the break information that they had. So like I said, no GIS, uh, but what we did have was scans of the as belts. Uh, and somewhere between 15 and 20 years worth of historical break data. And using the process that I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, we basically picked a part of town that was viewed as being really, really problematic and 
we digitized that information. Uh, and this is the map that we came up with. Um, we basically used the, the as-builts to build out the pipe network and then use the historical break data by address uh, to associate breaks with individual pipe segments. And although the general consensus at the utility was this entire area was in really, really bad shape, once we actually uh, analyzed the data, we saw that that wasn't really the case. So what we did is we basically color-coded the segments by the number of breaks in the database. And that allowed us to really point out the most problematic sections of pipe. Um, it's a little close up of, of the bad section and you can see there's a big problem up here um, and we've got something going on here in the middle now obviously the GIS map is not going to tell us what's causing the problems but it will help us focus our efforts and this also shows us that most of the pipe in this area that was generally considered and to be in bad shape were actually performing better uh, than expected although there were a couple of truly problematic areas that uh, uh, needed further investigation, but doing this type of analysis basically allowed them to focus on the problem areas first. Uh, the two biggest problems um, uh, were the ones that showed up in red, and by looking at those numbers of breaks over time, we actually found that the breaks in the troubled areas had been increasing over time from one every two years in the early 2000s to about three a year in 2016. Um, so this is also the kind of information that a GIS can really build out. And by targeting those leak prone breaks for replacement, uh, you know, allows the system to dramatically reduce the overall number of breaks and the cost associated with fixing them while having the least service disruption. Uh, the other really bad area was this, uh, this corner here that had 23 breaks in 14 years, most of which were localized up in the sort of Northeastern bend. Um, you know, if they add in, uh, cost per mile uh, for replacement and some other information, um, they could actually use this to develop the targeted uh, capital improvement plan. So you know, it's kind of an idea of some of the things that you can do. Um, recognize that there's gonna be times when you leverage data to make the maps, and there are other times when you're gonna basically leverage those paper maps uh, uh, for your data. So let's look at uh, a couple of examples of using maps to develop data. So uh, one example that we did was a risk assessment that we did for a large water system. One of the factors that they identified as being relevant to the overall risk of their pipe, and Haley is gonna talk a lot more about risk in the next session, and I highly recommend that you attend that. Um, but in this case, they were looking at uh, the pipe depth of Bury uh, for their sewer lines, um, but they didn't really have any data on that. Um, so, what they did have was data regarding the depth of their manholes, which obviously intersect their sewer pipe. And we were able to use a definitional query like the one I showed you to before to look at manholes within those appropriate depth ranges that they had selected and figure out which pipe segments were connected to those. Uh, and we were able to develop a map like this, which identified the pipe segments that were within the depth tolerance that was of a concern, and then use that uh, to update the risk score. And you can see here uh, on this particular map, we've got some uh, red, orange, and yellow uh, assets highlighted that have high risk scores. So, uh, you know, this is one of those situations where we didn't have the information directly, but we were able to use GIS and the information we had to, to suss out what we needed. Um, this is another system that we worked with uh, that had used GPS to capture the locations of pipe breaks in their system. And they had a water system map that they had developed from CAD files and GIS drawings, but they also knew that there was some amount of pipe that hadn't been mapped in their system and they really didn't know where it all was. So using information about the accuracy of the GPS uh, to capture those break data points, we defined the distance that we would use to snap those breaks over to existing lines uh, and then see what was left. Um, and this is kind of the result. We've moved everything that was close to a main onto the main and things that were outside of a specified distance uh, didn't get associated with a pipe. Uh, and then what we were able to do is essentially calculate the distance from those unsnapped points to the nearest pipe and produce an approximate uh, length of pipe that hadn't been mapped. Is it perfect? No, but it's more information that they had and it also shows the areas uh, where unmapped pipe isn't at or isn't, isn't mapped. Um, and you know, this is from the same system. You can kind of see where all of the breaks are, uh, where the water lines are, 
Uh, this itself isn't particularly useful, uh, but if you take the information and do different kinds of analysis, this happens to be a coded hotspot map uh, where we associated breaks with lines um, most that were experiencing breaks most frequently and uh, developed this hotspot uh, where we again color coded things. So even though the system has breaks all over the place, uh, we could show them where the breaks were concentrated so that they could focus on those areas. So I want to give you a quick overview of, of GIS platforms, and then I'm going to show you a demonstration of mapping uh, the data that I showed being collected in the first half. Uh, there are a lot of different GIS programs out there. Um, the one you've probably heard of most is ArcGIS. ESRI, the Environmental Systems Research Institute, is the industry leader uh, for com paid commercial mapping projects. Uh, they have two main mapping programs that they offer, ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro. Uh, you can use these to create and publish highly detailed and custom maps uh, and view and edit and analyze spatial data. Um, they are quite expensive if you are thinking about using one of these and you're just starting out, we'd recommend that you go with ArcGIS Pro over ArcMap uh, because that's the direction that Esri is going. They're planning on phasing ArcMap out. Um, one of the downsides is that these products are designed uh, for the Windows operating system. So if you're a system that, or an individual that likes to use a Mac, um, these can't be run natively, although you can use a program like Parallels or Bootcamp uh, to run two different operating systems on a Macintosh, which is what I actually do. Um, the nice thing about Esri is they've got a wide range of integrated products, um, uh, data collection apps, uh, you know, data publishing, dashboards, all kinds of things, uh, and many of them are utility specific. They've got paid training courses, uh, covering a variety of applications and concepts and methods, um, but they are expensive. You know, Esri licenses can cost thousands of dollars per year, depending on the kind of license that you're using, uh, and it's definitely the most expensive option uh, that we're presenting here. That being said, it is an industry standard. There's, on the other end of this spectrum, uh, not in terms of functionality, but in terms of cost, there is a program called QGIS or QGIS, uh, which is a free open source alternative uh, to Esri products. It's supported by a huge network of volunteer developers. They regularly update and improve the software. Uh, there are many uh, state and, and local agencies and some entire countries that use this option for uh, their mapping processes. Um, it runs on just about every operating system you can think of, Windows, Mac, Linux, Android. And like the Esri products we mentioned, it allows users to create you know, very detailed custom maps, manipulate data spatially, and provide perform a wide variety of analysis. Um, both Esri and QGIS products have a relatively steep learning curve, but there is a wealth of information and tutorials out there for free online that you can uh, use to get started. You know, QGIS actually has a specific resource called the GISLounge.com that has free online tutorials. Uh, and the software itself can be downloaded free at downloadqgis.org. So if you know this is something you're interested in getting into, this is a free option uh, that's available to you. Uh, you can also use things like Google Earth, uh, which works on a wide variety of uh, operating systems. Um, but unlike you know, the, the GIS products like QGIS and Esri, it doesn't really allow you to view or edit attribute data. It's more of a visualizing where things are approach, which can, for a small system, be very, very good and sufficient. Um, you, know, you can enter the asset, app assets in Google Earth, but you can only interact with them in somewhat limited ways. Uh, but it is very easy to use. And another similar product is called Google My Maps, which works similarly to Google Earth, but it runs in a web browser and it offers a few more options in terms of uh, sharing the maps that you create. So like you know, the, the data collection applications, um, we've sort of laid out a little uh, grid here as a way of thinking about uh, what road you might go down to. Uh, if you're thinking about going down this road, I would suggest that you do something similar. Uh, look at the options that you can afford or that you're interested in too, and then think about uh, what sort of functionality you need and use this grid approach to, to figure out uh, what's, what's gonna be done or what you're gonna use. Um, I wanna go over some quick mapping resources and then we'll look at a short video. Um, Remember, you've got a lot more data than you probably think. Um, you know, there is most systems have got as-built, uh, maps locked away in filing cabinets. You may even have some digital maps that can already be converted. Uh, so when you're starting out, think about 
uh, what data you have and uh, how you can can uh, manipulate that and, and leverage that for uh, developing new maps. Um, those paper maps can be geo-referenced. Uh, you know, I'm going to give you a quick sort of quick and dirty demonstration, but you know, here we've got a set of paper maps um, that we've digitized, laid on a map uh, in the in the digital world, uh, and you can sort of see the process here, where we've got uh, multiple maps laid over, and we've used these to create uh, the the underlying digital map and present the whole thing as an entire sequence. You know, as we talked about previously, you know, field data collection is going to be really, really important, um, and in many cases is going to be the only uh, way you can get certain attribute information. So if you're going to be getting into mapping, recognize that field data collection is going to be part of your world, uh, but that's okay. Doing that process actually helps you uh, learn a lot about your system. Got one more poll before we move on and show our mapping demonstration. Thank you, James. So again, we're asking attendees to answer the following question to the best of your ability. It's a true or false. Asset management helps a utility spend its limited resources in the best way possible. True or false? Yeah, this is kind of jumping back to the beginning of the presentation just to see what you retained. And we'll leave this poll open for a few more moments here. And getting ready to close this poll in three, two, one. And so everybody nailed it. <laughs> True. <Excellent. laughs> awesome. Yeah, I mean that's that's what this whole series is about, and that's what asset management is all about. You know, nobody has all the resources they need to do all the things, and we're here, and asset management is here to help you with that prioritization. So I'm going to give you a quick uh, mapping demonstration just to kind of show you how the process works. I don't expect you to be able to create a map uh, after watching this, but I do want to kind of step through the process. Uh, this is uh, Luke put this together to kind of show how this process works uh, and hopefully to show that it's not quite as scary as it might seem. Uh, we are probably going to run over about three minutes uh, with the Q&A. This is about a nine minute video, so I apologize for that in advance, uh, but I definitely think this is worth watching and do hang out because there is a quiz at the very end of the session. So uh, let me get this going. We start with the ArcMap program opened to a new blank map. Using the Add Data button in the upper left, we can bring our shapefile into the map by clicking Add Data and browsing to the file location of the shapefile. Select the shapefile, click Add, and we can see the points we mapped for hydrants drawn in the map view. We can see the data layer we just added listed in the table of contents on the left. By right-clicking this layer and selecting Open Attribute Table, we can see the attribute data that we collected in association with each point. Now let's give these hydrants some context by adding a base map. We can do this by clicking the Add Data button and this time selecting Add Base Map. There are a number of different base maps to choose from. Note that the use of these base maps requires an active internet connection as the base maps themselves are housed on Esri servers. We will use a topographic base map for now by selecting topographic and clicking add. Now that we have a base map, these hydrant locations are starting to look good. Next, we will cover a few simple ways you can symbolize your data. Right-click the hydrants data layer in the table of contents and select properties. From the layer properties window, navigate to the symbology tab. On the left in the column under show, select categories. This will allow you to divide the data into categories and symbolize each category differently as opposed to using the same symbol for all hydrants. Once categories has been selected, click the drop-down menu under value field. 
Here, we are selecting the field from the layers attribute table that we will use to symbolize the data into categories. We will select the manufacturer field to symbolize the hydrants by their manufacturer. With the field selected, we then click the add all values button on the bottom. This adds each unique value from the manufacturer field in the layers attribute table. We can then assign new symbols to these values by double clicking the symbol shown next to each value in the center. This opens the symbol selector window where a new symbol may be assigned. We will give each manufacturer a new color and increase their sizes a little so we can see them better. Using the Identify tool, we can see that the symbols have been applied correctly. If you would like to use custom or predefined symbology, you can import symbology from a .lyr file. We will do this using a .lyr file we have already created for this purpose. To do so, right-click the hydrants layer in the table of contents and select layer properties. Back on the symbology tab, click import in the upper right. On the import symbology window, leave the first radio button selected that says import symbology definition from another layer in the map or from a layer file. Click the yellow folder icon to browse to the location of the .lyr file that you would like to use. In this case, we will select our water hydrants.lyr file and click add and then click OK. The symbol from the .lyr file is shown in the center and by clicking apply, all hydrants in the layer will be drawn with our custom symbol. Next, we will cover the basic process for mapping our data in Google My Maps. Google Maps and Google My Maps are different sites. On the My Maps homepage, select Create a New Map in the upper left. This opens up a new map with a base map and one empty data layer. You can switch between a variety of different base maps using the base map drop down menu on the left. To add data into the empty data layer, click the blue import button under the layer's name in the table of contents. The import window tells you which file types can be used with My Maps CSV, XLSX, KML, or GPX. You can drag and drop the appropriate files here to add them to the map or click the blue select a file button to browse to the data. We will browse to the KML file we downloaded from Fulcrum. After selecting the file, the data is added into our map. Using your mouse scroll wheel or the plus or minus buttons in the bottom right will allow you to zoom the map in and out. In the table of contents on the left, we can see all the points in this layer. The data we collected for these points can be accessed by clicking the menu button to the right of the layer name, represented by three vertical dots, and selecting Open Data Table. The individual styles button under the layer name gives us options for how to symbolize the data. The style data by column option allows us to select an individual field from the data table and symbolize the data based on those values, 
like we did with the manufacturer field in ArcMap. For now, we will select Uniform Style, which will allow us to apply the same symbol to all points in the layer. In the table of contents, where each individual point used to be listed, it now says All Items. Using the Paint Bucket button to the right of All Items, we can set symbology for the layer. Here, we can change the point's color or select from a few popular icons. The More Icons button on the bottom shows you the full list of icons native to My Maps. To use your own custom symbol, click the Custom Icon button on the bottom left. This opens the File Import window. Just like when adding data to a layer, you may drag and drop the appropriate file here or browse to it by clicking the blue Select a File button. The file types that Google My Maps will accept for symbology are image files, such as JPEGs or PNGs. We will browse to the image file we want to use for our point symbol, in this case, our Hydrant PNG image. After the image file has been selected, you can see our new custom icon in the list of available icons. With our new symbol selected, clicking OK applies the symbol to all points in the layer. When you have completed building your map, you can share your finished product using the Share button on the table of contents. After clicking Share, you will be asked to provide a title and description for your map. Next, in the Sharing Settings window, you will see at the top a link to your map has been generated. This link can be shared via Gmail, Facebook, or Twitter using the buttons below your link, or you can copy and paste the link directly. You can configure the privacy settings for your map in the Who Has Access section. You may also invite individuals to view your map by name or email address in the Invite People section. Clicking Done will apply any changes you have made and send invitations to view your map to the users you have specified, if any. All right. And again, you know, we don't expect you to be able to uh, uh, generate a map uh, just having watched that, but we did want to kind of get across uh, how quickly you can actually put together a useful map uh, once you've learned the basics for one of these programs. Uh, you can really uh, very quickly put together useful information that you can share and use for analysis. Uh, I'm going to leave you with a couple of parting thoughts uh, before we move on to the Q&A. First off, I apologize for running a couple of minutes over, uh, but, you know, Harkening back to our, our opening slides about the asset management wheel and the idea of starting where you're at, you know, don't let what you can't do stop you from doing what you can. Uh, you know, if if what you have is a paper map and you want to start tracking events, you know, you can do that on paper now and switch to a digital format later. Uh, if you want to work your way up to a CMMS system, you can start with Excel right now and work your way forward. That's a nice thing about digital systems. Uh, you know. At a fundamental level, it's all ones and zeros and converting data back and forth is, is something that, that can be done. And with your maps and with your, your asset uh, inventory and every other component of, of asset management, um, remember to update it when you get new data. You know, no matter how much effort you put into maps or anything else, if you don't keep them up to date, they will eventually become uh, inaccurate. Uh, so, you know, annual uh, reviews at least are, are advised. I think we have one more quick poll to wrap up this quiz question, uh, and then we'll open the floor for questions and give you some contact information. Thank you, James. So again, our last poll question, and we ask that you please answer it to the best of your ability if interested in receiving credit. This is a question that you can select multiple answers for. And again, we're asking, please select the minimum asset attributes to track in asset inventory. And again, we're hearkening back to the first part uh, of the session, but I think this should be uh, not too difficult to complete. Thanks, James. 
and I see answers are trickling in. I'm just gonna leave this open for a few more moments. I know we have passed our time, but I wanna make sure folks can get their answers in. And getting ready to close this poll in three, two, one. And right on the money, all of these answers that were provided are the correct answer. Exactly, they're all they're all correct. Um, and obviously there's a lot more that you can include. I do realize we've gone over time. Um, so uh, this is the part where we would normally have Q and A. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes to answer questions, but I'm gonna put our contact information up here uh, so that if you wanna ask us some questions offline, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, and if there are any questions that we don't get to uh, in this current format, we'll make sure to answer them in a document form and send the answers out to everybody that has attended today. So with that, you know, thank you very much. And uh, the floor is open. And it looks like, James, that there weren't any specific questions that came in. So anybody that would like to email you in the future with any questions, please feel free. But I think that... Um, we are good to end the webinar and Tess is, or excuse me, Savannah, <laughs> is going to be sending out a follow-up email with the recording, I believe. Perfect. Yeah. And again, if something comes up uh, in the meantime, feel free to reach out to us at any time and we're happy to work with you. Thank you, James and Haley. And yes, just to reiterate, that follow-up email will include both the recording of this training and also um, the post webinar quiz that is required for credits. If you do have any issues accessing that post webinar quiz, please let us know immediately um, at smallsystems at syr.edu. Again, that, inform that contact information is available in your registration invite um, and other things. And really quick before we end, we actually did just get one question come in about the Excel spreadsheet that you mentioned earlier, James. So can you can either reach out to James and he will send that to you, um, or we have your contact information and um, James can also reach out to you and, and send you that Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, it's it's on our website along with a whole lot of other asset management resources. Uh, reach out to me. I'm happy to send it to you and point you at the other ones as well. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, James, for being here to provide your expertise for all of us this afternoon, and Haley for stepping in and facilitating, um, and everyone that joined us this afternoon. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and we hopefully will see you at our next training happening May 5th. Thank you very much. Have a good day.